the Phillips Gymnasium in Bartlesville, they play pickup basketball these days. But years ago, this was home court of the legendary Phillips 66ers round ball team. The 66ers were the best known team in the country um, and were uh, frequently played in Madison Square Garden and in all the big arenas around the country. Was the coach. Jack Haskins grew up near Bartlesville and was always a big fan of the 66ers. It was a basketball team of Phillips Oil employees that began playing in 1919. For 50 years, they were king of the hardwoods. Top college players in the country, like all-star Bob Curland, would come to Oklahoma to work for Phillips by day and play hoops for the company at night. They would win year after year after year, win uh, national championships, uh, AAU championships. The 66ers have been the team that every other team dreams of upsetting. It didn't matter if they played company teams or colleges, the 66ers usually won. And their greatness extended beyond the court. Most players had successful business careers at Phillips Petroleum. Four players became president of the company. These guys were leaders of the community, were leaders of their company, and were the best basketball players in the world. So it was a great example for all of us young kids to see. The beloved Phillips 66ers played their final game in 1968, fading from the hardwoods when pro basketball got popular. But Jack Haskins still idolizes the Phillips 66ers, his boyhood basketball heroes. We patterned ourselves after these guys, and we all adopted uh, their numbers. They were legends to us. With Oklahoma Memories, Jack Frank. This is basketball that drew the phrase greatest game of all time. At Madison Square Garden in New York, the Phillips Oilers score as 18,000 plus rabbit rooters look on. Facing the Oklahomans in this Olympic trials playoff and scoring are the University of Kentucky court men. Here is basketball at its smartest and most aggressive best. An emotional workout for spectator and player alike. Pitting the best of the AAU and college quintets, the game is a thriller. An Oilers tally brings swift response from the Wildcats, who find these Sooner defenses tough but keep clawing away. The fortunes of war rise and sag and rise again. And at halftime, the score is even Steven. Ten men from the two teams will play in the Olympics. The Oilers do it again and bring roars from the fans. And then, in a last-minute surge, the Oklahomans wrap it up for keeps. And the finishing touch in this basketball finale is provided by lanky seven-footer Bob Curlin. They can't stop him. It's in, and there's your ball game. The Oilers win 53 to 49. Nice going, both teams. And coaches Browning and Rupp. Next stop, Olympics. Sixers, many time national AAU champions, one of the nation's top ranking basketball teams, a fast, smooth running machine that consistently piles up points against the toughest opposition the country has to offer.
brand of basketball uncorked by this squad is convincing testimony to the truth of sport's oldest adage, practice makes champions. For the payoff of cheers and championships has to be earned, earned by long, grueling hours of drill and practice. What looks smooth and easy to the spectators comes only as the result of perfect conditioning, teamwork, and concentration on fundamentals. See how the Phillips team goes about shaping itself for the schedule ahead. This aggregation of all Americans drills just as hard, just as conscientiously as any squad of beginners. You might think they don't need practice, but they know otherwise. Daily workouts are the unshakable rule. former All-American AAU star who led many great Oklahoma University teams in his college career is a strong believer in constant drill on fundamentals. Under Browning's guidance is some of America's finest cage talent. Six-foot Marty Nash, ex-Missouri University star, a veteran in the 66 lineup. Cab Rennick, six-foot-three, an All-American guard at Oklahoma A&M. A newcomer, Buddy York, six foot two, from East Central Teachers of Ada, Oklahoma. Six foot seven inch Ed Beiser, who played college ball at Creighton University. Lonnie Eagleston, six one, another Hank Iba protege from Oklahoma A&M. Frank Stockman, six foot three, hailing from West Texas State Teachers College. R.C. Pitts, six foot four, University of Arkansas athlete. Also from Arkansas University, Gordon Carpenter, six foot seven. America's answer to the Eiffel Tower, seven-foot Bob Curland, another Oklahoma A&M All-American. Shooting setups or layup shots is an important part of the daily practice routine. It pays off in game competition again and again. For side setups, Marty Nash drives in hard, but relaxes on the jump. He lays the ball gently against the backboard. Watch it again. Nash also uses an excellent body fake to keep his opponent off balance. Driving from the left side, he shoots with his left hand, making it harder for the opponent to block. Players use the backboard in shooting side setups. Such shots from either the left or right side are always banked in. This is a good trick if you can do it. Some coaches paint a square on the practice backboard to accustom their players to aiming at that area when driving in for side setups. But there's a different technique in shooting setups down the center. Rennick doesn't use the backboard in this case. He eases the ball gently over the front of the rim, trying not to let it touch the rim at all. Of course, the easy way to sink setups is to grow seven feet tall, and in which case you can push the ball down through the basket from above. How would you go about guarding a man who can do this? Put a guard in the balcony? Or maybe equip your team with stepladders? In making long shots, both the one-handed and two-handed shot has its advantages, depending on the individual player. In general, Phillips players concentrate on the kind of shot that comes naturally to them. 
Once you've found your favorite shooting style, practice consistently, and you'll get your share of baskets in every game. Always shoot to hit, just as though you were in a ball game. When you get careless with practice shots, you'll find yourself developing bad habits that are hard to correct. Buddy York prefers the two-handed shot. Good two-handed shooting requires a balanced stance. Good knee bend to help lift the ball. And a definite follow through. Wrong. In shooting or in passing, the palms of the hand should never touch the ball. In this position, it's hard to relax and therefore hard to control the ball. Right. Only the sensitive cushions of the thumb and fingers are touching the ball. Hands cut, so finger pressure is light and evenly distributed. The ball gets its motion from a snap of the wrists. Fingertips merely guide and control its direction. Those favoring the one-handed shot say it's possible to get the ball away faster. Also, you'll be in a better position after the shot to go in for the rebound. Again, the sensitive finger cushions only touch the ball, and one hand never overbalances the other, as may be the case with two-handed shots. Rennick shows how good wrist action and clean follow-through are essential in this, as in all types of shooting. Another shot used with much success by the Phillips team is the overhead shot. Watch how Shorty Carpenter comes to a complete stop, then jumps straight up, maintaining perfect balance. Here's a perfect jump shot following a pivot. It's almost impossible to guard an overhead shot. Nash is perfectly balanced after the shot, able to move in any direction. So the quick stop, straight up jump, good wrist snap, and two points. Another shot that can't be overemphasized is the free throw. Just recall the games you've seen that were lost by a missed free throw. Each Phillips player must hit 50 free throws each practice session. A chart of individual records is kept in the dressing room. Important in good free throwing is the relaxed stance. Deep knee bend to give plenty of lift on the ball. And a good follow through. After each shot, the player steps back from the free throw line to relax. Then, get set again on an easy throwing position. The ball is balanced on the fingertips. Fingers in an easy, comfortable position. He lifts the ball straight up and flips it forward with the wrists. A good free thrower is an asset to any team. Here again, practice pays dividends. Accurate passing is the keynote to successful offense. Early in the season, Phillips uses this drill to sharpen their passing. pass reaches the receiver chest high. A pass that's too low means precious seconds wasted in getting the ball away. And a pass like this is fine for the other team. The chest high pass is a pleasure to handle. Easy to catch, easy to throw. The push pass the bounce pass, 
and the underhand pass are the three passes used most of the time. First, the push pass. Accurate, easy to receive. As in all shooting, only the cushions of the fingers touch the ball. It's thrown with a snap of the wrist and plenty of follow through. But many times, through the air passes can be deflected. That's when the bounce pass comes in handy. Delivered like a push pass, the bounce pass should hit the floor with a snap, about in line with the defensive player's feet. Properly placed, it's almost impossible to intercept. Ed Beiser uses the hook pass when he's closely guarded at the end lines after dribbling. He takes a short cross step with the left foot. The ball is hooked against the forearm and directed to a teammate with a sweeping overhead motion. And he's in position to continue play. Carpenter's underhand pass is a convenient time saver and works well in pinches. It's a snap pass to be used where half seconds count. For accurate long passing, the baseball throw is useful, but it takes a fast man like Carpenter to catch his own pass and score. A good passing and conditioning drill is the three-man figure eight. It can be executed with the underhand pass, as here, or with the push pass. For variety, try it with the bounce pass. Each man, after passing to a teammate, follows behind his receiver. This is good setup practice, too. Another ball handling routine for conditioning the Phillips squad is this tipping drill. Looks easy, doesn't it? But try it, keeping three balls going. As much as any other fundamental in basketball, the dribble requires coordination and balance. Regular dribbling exercises are included in Coach Bud Browning's practice sessions. Here's a drill used to develop high dribbling speed. The team first completing the cycle of setups wins. The losers run five extra laps around the gym. Try it. It's a good game. And for developing good control on the low, tricky dribble, try this. Keep the knees bent, hips low, and change hands with every change of direction. one drill is used to develop control in dribbling. Watch the low crouch of the dribbler, the frequent change of pace as he tries to maneuver himself into scoring position. A good dribbler like Marty Nash keeps the ball constantly in the zone of control, not too close to his feet, not too far from his body. He doesn't slap or bat the ball, but pushes it gently to the floor with the cushions of the fingers and hands. And remember, keep low. A variation is the two-on-two -two drill that combines good dribbling form with passing control. Dribbling includes quick starts and stops, and of course pivoting. In practicing pivots, the player clamps his feet down, keeps knees well bent, and pivot foot steady on the floor. In 
pivoting, keep the ball away from the body to prevent the guard reaching it. Well, the delicate grace of the ballet. It may look a little ridiculous, but it's a big help in improving defensive footwork. Let's go back to that one-on-one -on -one drill again. This time, watch Frank Stockman, the defensive man. His feet are kept wide apart, his weight evenly distributed, allowing him to shift quickly in any direction. His arms are spread to deflect a pass or shot. Above all, he sticks close to his man, always playing the man rather than the ball. Thus, he's not fooled by fake passes or shots. Team play, strictly man-for-man -man defense, makes each player responsible for one opposing player. He stays with that player wherever that man goes. In this defense, one guard must step back to allow his teammate to pass through the screen. The man guarding the ball handler is given the right-of-way by his teammate. offensive team is using a series of tight screens, a strictly man-for-man -man defense breaks down. In this case, the shifting man-for-man -man or modified zone defense is best. Each defensive man guards his opponent until he's screened off. He then switches opponents with a teammate. team uses the word switch to signal a shift of opponents. Shifting man-for-man -man defense sometimes becomes so effective that it's necessary to change games. In such cases, play football. Today, basketball puts the accent on the offense. A team having a tall setter like Bob Curland, who's also a good ball handler, can use him to best advantage at the post or so-called pivot position. He's the key player in the attack, originating the plays. He may pass to a teammate who gets open for a set shot. Occasionally in the best circles, shots are missed. A good pivot man stays in position to handle the rebound. Or when he sees the opportunity, the pivot man can pass off to a teammate driving in for a setup. Again, he may be an offensive threat in his own right. The pivot formation is always a good offense because of its variety of options. And at the post position, the big man has the advantage. Sometimes, that is. On the offense, the Phillips 66ers have become famous for their fast break. It depends first on the element of surprise, a sudden or unexpected change in team possession of the ball. When this happens, the team takes this formation, the ball always in possession of the man in the center of the court. Notice the two flankers and the two trailers. As you know, the object of the fast break is to get down the floor before the other team has the chance to set its defense. Remember, the ball always goes down the center. The center man is the key man. He decides in a split second who's in the best position to make the setup. If 
the center man is stopped at mid-floor, he'll pass to a flanker who moves to the center. Let's run that back. Remember, the ball always goes to the center. When the opposing team's defense is set, the offensive weave is put into operation by the Phillips team. Four men maneuver the ball on the back court. As each man hands off the ball, he takes a screening position. This continues until an offensive opening is spotted. Like the post or pivot formation, the offensive weave opens the way for numerous optional plays, set shots, set ups, post shots, and many others. The weave in operation is a continuous series of handoffs and screens. For this reason, it's highly effective against a strictly man for man defense. Again, here's how the handoff and screen operate in the weave. Notice that the man taking the ball is in position either to continue the weave or drive in for a setup. Once more, watch the screener. Remember the man receiving the ball always drives in on the outside of the screener. The tighter the screens, the harder it is for defensive players to stick with their opponents. opportunity comes, bingo. Like most teams, the 66ers have a few favorite set plays. This one revolves around the pivot man. Watch the guard go around with the forward screening for him. Here it is again. And again, keep in mind, the guard goes on the outside of the screener. and he's open for the shot. Simple? Sure, that's why it's good. Perfect timing. Smart ball handling by the pivot man and good teamwork on the screens all add up to another score. When the opposing team gets the idea, starts sticking close to the guard, the 66ers can cross them up this way. The forward sets his screen as before, but when the defensive men follow the guard, the forward moves out for a set shot. Notice how the other forward screens for the man shooting. This is one of the best out of bounds plays in the game. It's worked from a box type formation. Watch number 66 as he screens for number 55. Both defensive players are left without a chance to guard the man shooting. As an option, in case the defense catches on and starts switching, then you can use this variation with the screener going in for the setup. Finally, for a second half surprise, the forwards can screen like this. Yes, winning basketball as played by a championship team is fast and smooth, a pleasure to watch. A top-notch team makes it all look easy, but let's not kid ourselves. Efficiency on the basketball court, as in any other sport, is built in practice sessions by hard, conscientious work. The formula used by Phillips is simply this. Keep in condition, drill constantly on fundamentals, and think in terms of teamwork. Put the team ahead of yourself. Good basketball players aren't born. They're made. Prove it to yourself in your own games that practice makes champions.
Charlie Bowerman can still sink a shot from 20 feet. When he shoots at the Phillips gym in Bartlesville these days, no one is watching. But there was a time when lots of folks came out. The local folks, all everybody in Bartlesville always came to the games. It was jam-packed every time. And we played uh, Charlie's talking about the days when the Phillips 66ers we were kings of the hardwoods. They were a team operated by Phillips Petroleum, back in that era when many companies had their own teams. Phillips would always manage to attract the nation's best players to Bartlesville. These guys would have careers with the oil company and play hoops at night. Charlie joined the 66ers in the early 60s. It was a win-win situation for a lot of people like me who probably weren't good enough to, to really last very long in the pros, but wanted to continue to play basketball. The Phillips 66ers were in existence about 50 years, during which time they dominated amateur basketball in the U.S. Playing against other company teams like the Akron Goodyears and Detroit Ford Mustangs, the 66ers usually won. Often, they were national AAU champs. When Charlie was playing guard in the 60s, they were almost unbeatable. It was unusual for us to lose more than five or six games a year. And when you're playing a schedule of you know, 60, 70, 80 games a year, and you lose only uh, maybe half a dozen games at most, one year we lost three games. When his playing uh, career ended, Charlie became a vice president of Phillips Petroleum. Then, in 1968, the Phillips basketball program was disbanded. But even to this day, the 66ers are celebrated as a great dynasty of amateur hoops. Charlie is proud to have been part of it. Anyone who is a uh, connoisseur of basketball uh, has, uh, has had some experience with or knows the Phillips 66ers. With Oklahoma Memories, Jack Frank. You make me feel so young. Me feel like spring has sprung and every time I see you grin I'm such a happy individual the moment that you speak I want to go and play hide and seek I want to go and bounce the moon just like a toy balloon you and I are just like a couple of tots Running across the meadow Picking up lots of forget-me-nots You make me feel so young You make me feel there are songs to be sung Bells to be rung And a wonderful fling to be flung And even when I'm old and gray I want to feel the way I do today time I see you grin, I'm such a happy individual. The moment that you speak, I want to go and play hide and seek. I want to go and bounce the moon just like a toy balloon. Oh, you and I are just like a couple of tots running across the meadow. Picking up lots of forget-me-nots You make me feel so young You make me feel there are songs to be sung Bells to be rung and a wonderful thing to be flung And even when I'm old and gray I'm gonna feel the way I do today Cause you make me feel so young Just like a couple of tots Running across the meadow Picking up lots of forget-me-nots You make me feel so young You make me feel there are songs to be sung Bells to be rung and a wonderful thing to be flung And even when I'm old and gray I'm gonna feel the way I do today me feel 
uniforms and Denver DC truckers square off in the championship game of the 62 National AU basketball tournament in Denver before nearly 8,000 fans. Gary Thompson, Phillips captain, shoots a jump shot. It bounds high and drops through. After the truckers miss, Phillips center Tom Robitaille misses a close jumper but grabs the loose ball and lays it in. Wally Frank goes high to block a shot by Denver's Don O'Gorick and then connects on a long jump shot on the baseline. Again, Frank blocks an O'Gorick shot out of bounds. Denver misses, Coaches rebounds for Phillips. And Frank hits another long jump shot. After another Denver miss, the 66ers miss three shots in a row. Finally, Robitaille fight makes the follow shot, and it's 13 to 4 Phillips with five minutes played. Robitaille gets two more points after a fine pass from Charlie Bowerman. Denver's Mike Moran now with Phillips wheels for a short right hander. The truckers miss, and Phillips has a fast break going. A beautiful pass by Thompson, and Coaches hits the layup despite a solid bouncing. But in quick succession, Denver's Joe Belmont hits a long two hander. Ron Heller connects on a follow shot. And Belmont drops in another two-hander to leave Phillips ahead only by five points midway of the first half. Then the 66ers, Jerry Ship heats up and hits a jump shot. And then another. A twisting follow shot by Al Tate for the truckers. Jim Hagen hooks a beauty for Phillips. And a few moments later, Hagen dribbles in for a layup after Moran misses an interception. Belmont's two-hander is still deadly, however, for Denver. It's two points for Charlie McNeil of Phillips and two more for McNeil 20 seconds later. But Denver still has Belmont. It's 31-22 Phillips with five minutes to play in the first half. It's ship again for Phillips. And it's Belmont again for Denver. Ship shoots from the near side. Carney Chrysler's jumper is good as Denver keeps fighting. Phillips maintains the pressure on a fast break as Denny Price feeds Bowerman. Price then hits a jump shot. It's matched by Denver's Chrysler. Four free throws by Denver in the last minute leave Phillips leading 39-32 at halftime. As the second half gets underway, high-scoring Dennis Boone gets his first points of the game for Denver with a long one. Bowerman's set shot misses, but the alert Kojis lays it in. Boone hits another jump shot. So does Kojis for Phillips. 
A deceptive move by Bowerman frees him for a driving layup. Bowerman misses, but again, Kojus is there for the tip in. Hagen shows his versatility with the jump shot. Great ball handling ends with two points for Thompson, and Phillips holds an 18-point lead midway of the second half. Chrysler hooks from the right, and it's good. Belmont's jump shot hits. And Harvey Sauls pops in a long one, and Denver trails now by 12 points. Thompson sees McNeil open, and it's two points. Denver's Chuck Rask fakes and drives for a basket. Heller steals the ball. And winds up with two points, and the 66ers lead is cut to 10. Robitaille's follow is good. But Tate's follow shot offsets it. Under international rules, the middle line is disregarded as Bowerman shows how to protect the ball. Finally, Thompson hits a long jumper as the 30-second clock runs out. Keller hits for Denver. And Belmont, a great little competitor, follows suit. Phillips now leads only by eight points with nearly three minutes to play. The 66ers keep the ball with their eyes on the 30-second clock. Once more, it's the incomparable Thompson as the 30-second clock runs out. Chrysler scores for Denver after Coaches it hit two free throws for Phillips. Bowerman's two free throws are followed by a jumper for Denver by Heller. Phillips uses up practically all the remaining time. Bowerman gets the final points of the game. A desperation shot by Denver ends it with the Phillips 66ers winning their 10th National AU Championship in the last 22 years, 71-59. His teammates immediately hoist their captain, Gary Thompson, to their shoulders. It was his last game in a brilliant five-year career with Phillips. On the other end of the court, it is the usual sharp contrast as Denver coach Les Lane heads for midcourt to congratulate Phillips coach Bud Browning and his assistant Bob Plump. It was the sixth championship for Browning. The Marine All-Stars were fourth in the tournament. The Akron Goodyears were third. And their coach, George Swires, and Captain Bob McLaughlin accept the trophy from tournament manager Big Bill Grimes. Coach Lane and Captain Joe Belmont are awarded the runner-up trophy. And Coach Browning and Captain Thompson are handed the big championship trophy, which joins the others in the Phillips Trophy case in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. The high spot of the ceremonies is the presentation to Gary Thompson of the coveted Lou Wilkie Memorial Award for the most valuable player in the 1962 AAU tournament. <laughs>